That's weird. Hold on, play that sound again. <laughs> play that sound again. I just want that. You know the sound. How have you, how have you done that? Play that sound again. Well, it shouldn't be on there. <laughs> ah, ah! I feel like I know. Uh, that's that's a, a face and a sound I they are. never intend to see. Phil, do that again. Make it make that noise again. I'm not sure I can. This is JB's. I don't know how no, I'm not interested anymore. No. I, ju- I just wanted some JB. JB gr- lifting. Action. Oh, are we, are we recording? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't playing on. I'm a very, I'm a very loud lifter. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is an off-field uh, podcast. We separated the two because I didn't want to get some of, the, some of these stories to get mixed up. Some of them are quite negative and we probably will have a little bit of a moan or uh, vent some frustration at some point on this podcast. And I didn't want to get that... Uh, that to get mixed up too much with the celebration of what has been some amazing rugby on the field. So uh, mm. let's go. We can rattle through this. One thing we mentioned on the last podcast, the retirement, sudden retirement of Al- uh, Justin Tipperick and Alan, Alan Wynne-Jones. Yeah, what, yeah. Tell me the story about this. I, 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 I read this as they are being allowed to do it on their own terms before they were omitted from the Wales squad. Oh, wow. I never saw that. I just thought they got bored of being paid real money. <laughs> is that how you uh, yeah I, that was my read so they were they were named in the wider squad ah I see um, now I think that's Alan Wynne Jones I think Tips has got a foot injury as well oh okay so it, it might be that he wasn't going to make it but, but he, he knows he's not going to make it for the foot injury and Alan Wynne Jones I mean it probably is time he might get a spot as kind of the Fourth choice lock, um, but not necessarily. Tell you what, they have ridden that guy and got every ounce of value possible. One hundred and seventy oh, yeah. caps, right, one yeah. seven zero. It's, it's bonkers. Yeah. He's um should just go for the extra thirty. It's nothing, is it? <laughs> <laughs> He's so close. Um, yeah, it's so good. Uh, someone tweeted that he played seventy percent of Welsh tests since nineteen thirty. <laughs> yeah, it's 20 percent of all of the Welsh tests. Oh <laughs> all my goodness! Every Welsh is twenty percent. It's unreal, isn't it? It's um, remarkable. And it was good for um, journalist Stephen Jones because he he was able to write about that today. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't read Stephen Jones's co- Stephen Jones's. Co- he, he wrote about Alan Wynne Jones, not about the sevens. Really? Yeah. He, he covered this week's seven last week, so yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, but they took it down, so we weren't. So anyone who missed it in the small window of time it was up didn't, didn't get to read about how annoying the sevens was. This yeah, week. so annoying. <laughs> that <Pesky> sevens. <laughs> Did you see any of the sevens? No, none. I've seen a few highlights. It's always even when you, even when we go to the sevens, we don't see the yeah. sevens. It does make you think who is watching sevens. Because it did, there were not that many people in the. No, because if we're not watching it, I mean, I didn't even know it was on. Really, I mean, when uh, it could be because I'm not on Twitter. I'm very disconnected from rugby in general. But like, it's not very well publicised. That nobody knows it. I mean, I well, don't. It, would any of your wider friends know it, that it happened? To the point where I actually googled um, HSBC Sevens London series, and it, I couldn't actually find out because I wanted to know. Um, uh, colleague of mine is there he's a south african yeah or zim but south african national support south africa um and so i was what going today hoping to see south africa in the knockouts and i just wanted to find out did south africa actually make it to the knockouts i i couldn't i was googling I, through their own website and i couldn't find out the only place for it was twitter was their wow. twitter yeah. account twitter's good for that well it's a it's obviously South Africa managed to get a bit of national pride in their sevens team because on the flight back from Greece, where I was, there was a a few South Africans who were flying from a golf trip in Greece to the sevens in London. <laughs> really, yeah, lads, to go and follow South Africa there. Fair play. Um, well, they, I, they if they were, flew in for the Sunday. They didn't make it out of the pool, so so they wouldn't have seen them. Oh well, <laughs> so that's well, the not about. They had a good time. Uh, so okay, there's that, that one ticked off. We got the situation with wasps. Let's get into this one then. Uh, Glad they're gone. It's exactly the right thing. You can't just it, go down for one by one week. So if you haven't seen what's happened, the RFU have said they ran out of time for to meet the deadlines to satisfy the requirements to be able to take their place in the English Championship for next season. So they've been demoted to effectively level ten. 
Um, playing kids' rules. The Wasps will be playing children's rules, which is incredible to think about. I think Worcester will never happen. I mean, Worcester's done forever. Yeah. Worcester might show up at level 10. Six ways will become housing. Um, but, they, you know, this is what needs to happen. I mean, this is going to happen now to, I'd say, all the other clubs. I mean, they can't all go to... It's amazing. They couldn't all go to the championship. And I think that's where most of them will want to head. So, yeah, uh, Wasps will be at level 10. Not playing real rules. Worcester will probably never show up again. Next up is London Irish. Well, I think the first thing to say is there's, there's a lot of fans of Wasps. An incredibly storied club that have had a lot of, a lot of great players and loads of faithful fans who've stuck with them through thick and thin and moves and and fans new and old at one of the various towns they've popped up at and they don't deserve any of this. Mm, yeah, I don't think it's a case of deserving, you know. So, didn't Glasgow Rangers go to the fourth? Yeah, uh, the fourth Juven- Juventus. Juventus did as well. They, they went down three three leagues. Presumably Man City will do for all their financial doping. <laughs> oh, no, they won't. They'll just, no. they'll, they just get away with it. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so... You know, it doesn't necessarily destroy your club. In fact, I have said this all along. If you're a Wasps fan, this is the best opportunity. I mean, yeah, the best opportunity you'll ever get to be involved with well, your club. Literally, you could go and you, you yeah. could go and be an average player and go and pull on that well, Wasps they, jersey. Yeah, it's amazing. In their, in their statement, they said um, they've got 230-something players and 30-odd coaches to select a team from next season. And I was kind of like... Who, who are those players? I, I think a load of them I will think be just... I think they've got an amateur side. They have an amateur side re- yeah, already that's at level seven. Registering in. So I'm assuming like, they will probably join forces with that amateur team. Yeah, I'd say so. And although that amateur team want to be careful because you don't want to just repeat the cycle again. Yeah, but, so yeah. at some point... it does point, jump them three years up the, up the pyramid. So at some point you need another amateur team. So London Welsh ditched their professional team went back with the amateurs, and now yeah. the amateurs are doing well if they get promoted. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we've got a problem, haven't we? So, um, actually, where are London Welsh now? They are, they might even be like level five. I mean, they're doing really, really well. Really well. Mm. And they've got a massive club. And this is the thing, well supported, well financed, great, 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 great ground, all that sort of stuff. Um, Wasps will be well supported, and there will be loads of backers there. And they'll just be a rugby club that grows and grows and grows and grows. So before you know it, they'll be at level five, um, you know, level four, and they'll be back in the championship in no time unless it's ring fenced. So this is far from the end of Wasps. Well, unless the RFU end all rugby, which is quite possible. <laughs> unless well, you mentioned one word there, ring fence, which this was the bit that I found most interesting about the statement that Wasps made. Effectively, Wasps have said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in a nutshell, Wasps said we weren't able to convince the financial backers that were of which there were several wanting to fund the club they couldn't be convinced to actually pull the trigger for the simple reason that the rfu couldn't give them clarity about what was happening in terms of promotion relegation now all i want to say about this and what i found interesting and i think this is this i to me is one of those situations where um you reap what you sow because for years, championship teams have been saying, we can't operate like this when we don't know what the, uh, uh, the yeah. ins and outs are. And Wasps were one of the teams who were quite happy to shut their trap door, mm. to keep championship clubs out. And even for the champion- championship clubs that were coming up, they were quite happy for them to be funded on a completely different level, have no access to P-shares, to, make it a complete, uh, to have the playoffs only finishing in June so they couldn't recruit a team, to completely stack the, the deck against any team coming up. The, to then complain about it now is uh, that's the bit I've got absolutely well, no sympathy well, also, for because it's just tough shit. It's, what, it's, it's the system you created. What were they trying to sell? So it they, doesn't sound like they sold their backers a specifically convincing story. No, they wanted to sell the backers. The Well, the backers were interested, they say, in wanting to know that they are investing something which can get back to the premiership. And yeah. So therefore, that's reta- when they have reta- to stop, right? retain their P-shares and all of that. Right, OK. So this is where the conversations need, need, need to stop. Get rid of your P-shares... If you're going to play professional rugby you want to, in England, you want to play it in the Championship. There's nowhere else to go. You can't go back to the Premiership because when you get back to, back to, to the Premiership, you'll be forced to spend money, which you don't have, with a CVC deal, which, which will ruin you, in a competition that is massively degrading year on year on year. At some point, all of these teams can't go to the Championship. But imagine if Wasps were in the Championship. And imagine if London Irish came... 
back in back in, in into the championship. You're going to have a situation where you've got 10 teams struggling with rubbish squads compared to France and probably the URC in the English top top league who are continually losing players. And the only show in town, really, if you're a serious business person, would be the championship. Why, why are you saying the only show in town? I don't understand that. Because, well, because this, cause the squads are, not, are going to be of lesser quality. The Yeah, but you can do whatever you the want with it. The funding's significantly less. Yeah, the funding, yeah, but at some point, all that funding is going to go. So at some point, the premiership, I mean, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. It is, it is a sinking ship. You're better off if you're going to spend a little bit of money, say a couple of million quid I, I don't or a million quid. I don't understand the premiership. You don't want to be there. Don't you don't understand. want to be there because you're going to make no money. Um, you're going to not, not going to make money in the championship either. Yes, but it can be the championship can be sustainable with, with without a CVC deal, yeah. right? And then in the Premiership, all all of your central revenue has been taken Wait, by okay. a third. Well, devil's advocate, then if you if it's ring fenced, could you not do what Newcastle are doing and spend well below the salary cap? Let's but, talk but within your means. Well, thank you, Tim. Let's talk about Newcastle because they are a team who just don't get it. Right, Newcastle do not deserve to be in the Premiership. Full stop. Um, People do people do not understand what the salary cap is, and they particularly don't understand, in my, in my opinion at least, exactly what the principles of the salary cap are. So, if you are going to ask your players to voluntarily accept a salary cap, which is what it is, it is voluntary, because we're not even sure if this thing is legal. But the reason it's not taken to court, and the reason that... You know, they've not been challenged yet, is because the players, well, broadly speaking, accept it. It did get challenged by um, Saracens. They questioned the legality ah, of it. Ah, yes. And, but um, not in a UK court. Lord. Yeah, it was in a sports tribunal. Or, no, it wasn't even that. It was, they questioned... Just, or just within the... Their solicitors questioned the legality of the salary cap in the wider law, but in the context of a salary cap investigation, which is useless. Because all you need to do is, you know comply with the rules of the salary cap. That, that's what their sisters were, were tasked to do, and their sisters, if you remember, were dreadful. They were some of the worst the, sisters. Sar- well, the Saracen sisters basically didn't win a single point. No, not one. <laughs> not one. Um, uh, but but hold, hold on. It, it was, uh, so we've, talked before, right. we've so, talked before about a salary floor as well yes. as a salary cap. However, however, when there isn't one there, there's no, there's no necessity for Newcastle to do it. So it might be not... Um, the best thing for the product, and I totally agree with yeah. you. It's going to help. It's going to speed up the death of the Premiership if it goes that way. By by having by the whole point of the salary cap is to have competitiveness and, in, and encourage that. And if if some pl- if some clubs are not spending to the salary cap, it's going to decrease the competitiveness, which is the, what the salary cap is all about. Exactly. And I totally agree with you. However, I do also have sympathy if a club is not get, getting three thousand. Uh, crowds for some games. Yeah, but I mean, you've got to. This is the problem with the Premiership, right? If do you want the salary cap? Yes or no? Yes, we do. Okay, if you want a salary cap, you need to understand it's there to promote competition, and also there's give and take from the players. So you've artificially limited the players' earnings, which the players have accepted. But in return, you better be spending at least a minimum amount. Yeah, and you better try. And that try needs to be, to be and that needs to be imposed. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it absolutely yeah. does. And if you can't leave, because otherwise, it is it is a race to the bottom. Yeah, like just spend. If you're still getting the same TV money in, just spend less. If you're an owner of a club, a, and, but it, all the everyone would do that, which is a kind of tragedy, tragedy of the Commons type scenario, mm. which would devalue the TV money across the board. Yeah, which then third goes. I, mean, yeah, I was yeah. talking about this at length to some uh, blokes in Bournemouth Rugby Club who were pretty keen, and they have no idea about the CVC deal. Um, and I was explaining to them, I'm like, what? Their minds were blown. Is this how the, is this how the Premiership works? Like, yeah, this is exactly how it works. Exactly. So, if rugby is found, found itself in a, in, in a situation now with clubs like Newcastle, who don't, who have owners, who don't think their rugby club is that valuable to them, because the rugby club should be valued to them, not just as a rugby thing, which makes money, but you know something which they can network with, some sort of, you know, as they say in economics, a tangential. Um, sorry, their tangentially profitable businesses benefit from. Well, if they find themselves in that situation where you know Newcastle Rugby Club isn't that for them, they shouldn't be in the sport. They just shouldn't be in the sport. They've got to leave. And I think Newcastle should just basically ask them, ask to be relegated, or or take it seriously. One of the two. Well, okay. So what you, the necessity there is 
in your model, which I get, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but I'm just taking your point to its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is you have to have wealthy people who are willing to spend, as you've put it before, their child's inheritance That's right. in order to keep the premiership going. So would it, devil's advocate, would it not be better to have, like, look at a Bundesliga football model where 51% of every club is owned by the fans no. and, and you just... no. No, I mean, look, actually, do you know what? It, maybe it is, because it works for Bundesliga, so you know, it does work. We've seen it. I think if you're going to go for the salary cap NFL model, like, if you want an NFL, an NFL team now, you almost have to be invited in to, to get one. There is no one oh, out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, have to be, you have to be a multi-billionaire in the first well, place. Yeah, and you've got to pay many times, many times uh, mul- multiples of income to own the team, because it's so valuable to your political connections, you know, your business connections... The kudos that comes with, that's where rugby wants to be, right? But it's not. So all we do have is uh, people funding these, funding this thing, which has got a terrible reputation of being, you know, a bad competition, ran badly. In fact, when you invest in a rugby club now, particularly in, in the Premiership, you don't inherit the values of rugby, the so-called rugby values. You inherit the values of incompetence. You are actually tarred with the same brush as the people that run the thing. <laughs> so it's actually it's actually a negative. And to push the, to push this on, it look well. There's a deadline looming of next weekend for London Irish, and if they cannot have this takeover sorted and the um, confidence in the funds coming, then they're going to follow Wasps and Worcester. And I don't know. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to bet at the minute, but. Uh, Bearing in mind how close we are to that date now, it's not looking good for London Irish. I know, it's a, it's a real shame. I've really enjoyed London Irish this season. But, you know, I think they all need to go, go bankrupt. I really think they all need to go bankrupt. Just to jump back, when Phil said a couple of weeks ago, show me the outcome you want and I'll show you, or show me the incentive, I'll show you the behaviour or the outcome. Sh- show, show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. Right. The incentive is we want to have a, a league of 10 teams so that we yeah. can fit it around international rugby. And then what do you know? Oh, London Irish are the first to go pop and we'll go to a 10-team league. It's, this is this is actually what they want in a, in a weird, well, I'm perver- sure it's perverse a, yeah. way. Not want, want's a tough thing to it say. It is but. what they want, but it's also the only thing they're left with. So they want it because it's the only option left. Yeah, yeah. Because at one point... They would have preferred to go to a fourteen team or a sixteen. I like, yeah. Like, why can't they make a twenty team league like um, the the Premier League, for example, work? Yeah, you ask. They'd want to be. Gr- you want a growing sport, so generally more teams going in is good because it creates a growing <laughs> yeah. sport. So if you ask, if you were to sort of sit down, if you were to sit down with um, ownership of a club, maybe five years ago. They'd be t- they'd be telling you like yeah we just need more home games it's home games that generate uh, generate our, our, our revenue that's the most important thing and rugby had this really bad situation a few years ago where just the amount of rugby was continuously growing and we never saw really any way to stop it now maybe it's grown as much as it, it can do but in a way you want that scenario where with looking for more games and it tells you how desperate these clubs are in that uh, desperate situation the, the clubs and league are in now that they're happy to have less games mm. and that's how serious it is they're happy to have less games so they want it but they want it because this is the only thing that thing that is left it's kind of like yeah i mean it's just it's I, just a sign of decline I, I think they want less fewer fewer games mm. i think they want fewer games if they're banking on the fact that everything else stays the same or in fact, increases, as in their slice of the yeah, yeah. Their slice the of the, the slice of the Premiership pie is now ten percent rather than eight percent or whatever it is. So they and they're banking on the TV money being the same. But, but what yeah. if BT Sport? Well, next year the TV deal is up. Yeah. So what well, if BT Sport just say, "Yeah, I'm not interested." And in last time, it was only BT um, yeah. went for it. No one else went for it. Whereas in the French league, there were three bidders. Hence, why the French league got a whatever it was, 20% increase in their deal size and Premiership stayed the same. Yeah, BT just paid exactly the same as they did previously for it. Minus a third, minus inflation. Well, that, that, that third is, is a massive one. And you called this yeah. at the very start. And again, you, you, you had articles in Rugby uh, in rugby Pass. You talked about it extensively on the pod. And I think a lot of people just thought you were being contrarian at the time. And you you do have that propensity. Oh, oh but, hang on, hang on. It was, uh, Tim, I don't know if you remember, 
the, the absolute geniuses who supported this were talking about growing the game. We've got to, if you ever hear someone talk about growing the game or investing, anyone that gets the word investing and spending wrong is an <laughs> idiot, right? So when they say the women's game, this is a classic one. Let's invest in the women's game. No, no, spend on the women's game because an investment requires some sort, some some sort of. Um, of return. Now, there's an element of, of gaslighting too. I don't know if you heard this, Phil. The women's game is by far the biggest commercial opportunity uh, the game's ever seen. So we just need to invest in it because obviously no one, no one thought of that. They mean spend. They mean spend. So yeah. And, and the issue I have in terms of spending, when you look at it, and, and you, you can look at the slice of money, the pound of flesh that Premiership clubs took from CVC. Hardly any of the clubs spent that money on things which can create a long-term legacy or benefit or m- generate more money, infrastructure, they just blew it on yep. salaries. And you look at the RFU and their management of the game, and they have done exactly the same. They've withdrawn money from grassroots, uh, withdrawn money from... They, they used to be quite good at... They, they'd give the championship, for example, £4 million. That's been reduced to £1 million. Um, which is uh, when you look when you put it in that context, it's unreal. But what they used to do was they would only release that four million pounds if it was being done to build infrastructure and facilities and things which could create long term so, growth of the game. Yeah, the, the, now the, it's all short term spending, and it's mm. all on wa- and what money there is is all on wages, not on. Well, yeah, but also the spending creates different problems. You see, so for the longest time. The RFP did spend a lot of money on the community game. Now, whether it's enough or how they spent it... Used to be, it. Uh, the mantra was always 50-50. Yeah. And now it's 73% on, on the pro game, I, I think. I didn't, I didn't know 70, that. 70-30. But it, was, it used to be. That, that was the RFU thing. It was always 50-50 pro. Yeah. Oh, well, look, this, this is the pressure of the French League, right? As that French League gets more and more powerful, that's 75, will become 80, will become 90, will become 100. And that's what will happen. But there is another side to this as well, which is... When the RFU were spending, not investing, spending on the community game, um, it actually had some really um, weird effects. So you get a lot of clubs now who are completely dependent on the RFU to do loads of loads of simple things. And I think the most successful clubs are the ones which will break, not break away from the RFU, but ignore the RFU and as a group will run their club for the benefit of their local community or whoever it is that that club serves. Even now, you see, oh, well, where the RFU with their coaches, where the RFU, where the RFU with this support, where the RFU with, um, uh, with that, it's completely, completely unhealthy. And the, the RFU have fostered an almost like, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? A uh, dependency culture. So the, the money which England sort of generated from the World Cup all those years ago, which was spent... I don't think has you know done any good for the game really. Dove, dovetails the dovetails the way a lot of people look at their governments these days. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Something must be. Yeah, someone must spend this money on <clears throat> from somewhere else, <laughs> and someone must. Uh, there, here is a problem. Why are the why is central government not sorting it? Why is the RFU not sorting it? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Hey, have you seen the thing from the RFU? Uh, it's a little. Um, let's see if I can find it for you. A little um, thing which was going make, making the rounds. Like a little poster about what the RFU hope to achieve. Um, here we go. So, this has been banding around. So, it's five points that the RFU want to um, want to bring on to rugby. So, having a brand or strap line helps to solidify ident- um, identity and encourages in- uh, inclusion with the intent of it being a club for everyone under one name. Is this advice to grassroots clubs? Yes. It's advice to somebody, right? <laughs> I don't know who. Uh, same offer for all. Equality amongst male and female members. Why don't we just have separate clubs? We we'll just have separate clubs. Like, then you don't have to worry about this nonsense. What, so, same kit, same fees, use of pitch and training schedules. Well, then... So this is all about men, women? I've got no idea what it this is. It's like just like... like um, mm. Hello, hello. It's Brooke DeVard, host of Naked Beauty, and I could not be more excited about Kate Spade New York's summer collection. They are celebrating 30 years of the brand, and the Kate Spade New York design team really outdid themselves with this summer collection. There's a gorgeous lemon-inspired raffia bag that I love, and the Bahama sandals. It's a low heel with a feather detail at the toe. Take me on vacation immediately so I have an opportunity to wear these. Go to katespade.com to shop the Kate Spade New York summer collection. Now, I 
promise you're going to find something incredible for your summer outfits. Modernized mentality, being aware of members' circumstances and improving emotional intelligence. Fuck off. Fuck off. Um, respect the old traditions with a modern twist. Moving away from alcohol and initiation as a sole focus. <laughs> Who are these people? And directing inclusion towards appreciation of members coming together. What does that mean? What does that mean? It, directing inclusion towards the appreciation of members coming to, That is word bingo. They've drawn those words <laughs> out of a hat. Um, empowering players through ethos, support, direction and ownership. What does that mean? Do you know what that means? Do, do you know, I, I, again... I, I, we mentioned him on the... I can't remember the chap's name now, but I would take... I, I, if I were a, a grassroots club, I would want to listen to best practice, not word salad. Yes. I would want to hear from <laughs> the boss of Rams. What is it you guys did? Yeah, exactly. Tell me. L- l- let me see what I can take from that that might work with my club because the male amateur rugby numbers have halved. Yep. We're, it's It's not just the premiership, which is... Like, on a, I'm going to use that phrase, uh, is facing an existential crisis. Rugby is. Yeah, 100%. And mm. Word salad on a poster is not doing anything. Modernised mentality. Who are you to tell me what the modern mentality is? I mean, it's just nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing. I'm so glad that I'm done, done with the game. I'm so glad I'd never have to deal with these dickheads ever again. <laughs> well, I, lo- I love the game. It's given me a lot. I'm enjoying. Yeah. I'm enjoying going through it with my son. I want to make. It, I want to make a difference. I want to help it grow. I, I yeah. Just um, despair. I despair sometimes at, at where the where the priorities appear to lie. What <sighs> uh, what what other off field stuff is there? Uh, we've got wasp. Uh, we did the oh, we did the wasp thing. So obviously, wasp won't be playing at Worcester, which is a, a thing. Yes. Um, there was something else. There was something else. Big, big, biggest week. Irish, Alan Wynne Jones and tips. Um, oh, we had. Well, I got sent a quiz. Oh, from our mutual friend Dolly Poole. Oh, you've been sent it. Friend, friend of. Po- oh, ah. So have you not been sent? I've so, not been sent a quiz. I've been. So. I got asked a question. I, I got. He asked me a question, which was he said was for a quiz. Ah, interesting. He so, said all will become clear right in time. right so i've got a quiz i think and this is fascinating so uh, this is fascinating first actually i forgot i must mention this david wells uh contact ted chasers at gmail.com he he uh he emailed saying that he tried phil's betting system for a year um which was unfortunately disrupted by wasps and worcester leaving the premiership but these are the results to recap phil said always bet on the home team unless they're playing the top or bottom of the league and if so do the opposite do you remember this uh, i don't but <laughs> it sounds like good advice he said occasionally i forgot to put a bet on in fairness and of course there was the wasps and worcester caveat uh, however i'm not sure it made too much difference to the result i hope you enjoy uh i hope you enjoy and based on the profit for the year and the time and effort that went into it I don't think I'll be doing it next season. <laughs> <laughs> so, my so, best... Uh, I'm, did, did I'm, actually... I'm just opening up the spreadsheet now. I've got a spreadsheet. You'd be wow. proud of this one. Oh, yes. Uh, let's go for total profit loss at the end. Uh, God, it's a really in-depth spreadsheet. Um, I love okay. it when people... Do I know. This sort of thing. It's amazing. Profit loss. Uh, profit loss... Okay, uh, I'm trying to find overall profit loss. Or is that overall profit loss? Mm. Uh, overall profit loss appears to be e- it's either minus eighteen pounds or plus eleven pounds. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's not too far off if that's the case. Well, my I, mean, be- that, that, I can't, I can't that, see which of the two it is. Anyway, I, that I, does I, show you that the the bookies have got it pretty like their um, predictions of things are actually pretty good. Yeah, so my betting strategy uh, was always, and Wasp and Wasp have messed it up, start with a fiver, and then divide that between the um, the ten game, six games? Uh, six games, yeah, when there was 13 teams. Yeah, yeah. Between the six games, 
yeah. plus one accumulator bat. Yeah. So you have all, all the individual games plus them one accumulator. So if everything comes in your way, you, you win a lot, but you all, you're guaranteed to be in business next uh, next week too. Hmm. So, you, so your five pound gradually goes down because you divide it week after week after week after week, but then occasionally you have a few, a few big wins. So I thought if I could build like an investment mandate for it and then see how that went, that would be better. Because the thing is you, ch- you start chasing odds and that's when you're completely lost. Yeah, yeah. You start and, chasing the, the long yeah. odds, you've got and no chance. don't make a bet until you've seen the teams. Look at yeah, the teams, yeah, yeah. do not look at the odds. And I always said, in my mind, then wait, the, wait the positions. And I always thought second row. If you win the second row battle, you can win the game. Will Skelton. And betting companies, as, as that's demonstrated, are relatively good. Yes. Because I, th- I think it was a moderate £11 profit over the season with your not bad. model. Yeah, which yeah. Is which not, is, not, which is not, not worth the time Not spent worth on the it. time effort, no. <laughs> um, but uh, what I would say is that betting companies, r- because rugby is a minority sport, when you have games like when uh, Saracens put out a really weakened team against Northampton, th- there's a lag between that team being announced and that being reflected in the odds. So, yeah, you, so yeah. as a rugby fan in the know, you can take advantage of that. Yeah, that is true. Interesting. And also, I believe a truly strong... I can't, by the way, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. allowed to. I yeah. truly strongly believe that... I, I don't know if other people that watch a lot of sports think that this is the case, but quite often you can detect the swing and momentum of a, lo- of a losing team becoming a winning team fairly quickly. Fairly quickly. I mean, I thought it was relatively obvious towards the, second, the end of the first half in the La Rochelle game that there was going to be a huge swing of momentum <clears> at <throat> some point. So, yeah, there are, there are various ways to bet on rugby. There's various ways to bet. I'd, I'd say if you were just going to bet on, New, on Newcastle, bet on them to win for the first half of the season. You'll probably get some quite good odds that come off. Yeah. The second half of the season, bet for them to lose every game. Perfect. And you'll just consolidate through the season. Agreed. Okay. Right, go on then, Phil. The, the quiz. So, um, Paul said he was, he was chatting to UJB. Yep. about how commentators ought to tell us how much players can lift so like Agreed. What, what's their squat, bench, all the rest of it um, as like one of the interesting snippets like when they say Nick Kennedy's mum's an author or yeah. um, mm. that kind of thing Johnny May uh, mum taught Ed Sheeran guitar correct or piano that's right or yeah. piano or guitar or, or, piano. yeah because Luke Narraway is dad's butcher yes <laughs> exactly and Jack Knowles' dad is a fisherman, fisherman. and yes. so is Luke Cameron Dickey's uh, is yeah. he uh, no, I don't probably. know about that. Let's just say, yeah. Uh, so, he said, um, obviously we can't get that data. However, because Poole is um, one of the fastest men over 40 in the country. Um, fastest men over 40, over 40? Uh, over 40, over 40? Uh, yes, fastest yep. men over 40. Oh, yes, he is. Uh, um, we can't get that data, but... Um, there is a website called powerof10.com, which aggregates all the data of every athletic meeting since the early 2000s. And he spent a lot of time looking up players' stats so w- from when they were running generally ah. as youth as- athletes. So he spent some time looking up many, many rugby players. And he's got a list of questions. So you don't need to write anything down for this. Okay. So you just... Shout the answers out, and I'll, I'll keep a little tally for who's going to get the points. Tim and JP. I love the effort here, and if you want to make any effort with a quiz, um, contact chasers at gmail dot com is the email address. Okay, question number one, JB. If you're listening, I am just just about still here. Who has got the better hundred meter time out of Caden Murley or Lewis Liner? Caden Murley. I would have said Caden Murley. Uh, the answer? It was a trick question. They've both done... Do you want to know... Do you, do no, you, let's have a guess. So their, their time... This was as 16-year-olds 16 or 16-year-olds. I Under 17s. 11.6 seconds. I have no idea, but that sounds... I was going to say 11.2, I don't know. 12.4. Oh, OK, That's miles away. So, 16-year-olds. Six, at 16. So, <clears throat> which is... Interestingly, not as fast as Ollie Poole is now, aged 40-something. Is that right? Yeah, he's fast. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's good, that. Um, so, question number two. Who, as an under-15, could throw a better discus, Gabriel Ibatoya or Max Ajomo? 
Oh, Max and Jomo. Uh, he's a very languid, I smooth. Say? I bet his technique was immense, Max Ajomo, and he's tall as well, which helps. But I'll yeah. go, I'll go Gab- Gabriel Libertoy because he's squat and powerful. Libertoy is correct. I thought it was, mm. um, uh, that's under fifteen. Libertoy threw thirty point one meters, and Ajomo, I have no idea if this is big or small. well. That's, that's it was that's it was Ajomo mid- only got middling. Ajomo only got. 23.8 metres so um, it would tell you a lot further um, question three uh, who has the better high jump PB Harry Randall or Rafi Quirk ooh see Rafi Quirk's bigger but he's really explosive they're both really explosive I'm going to go Harry Randall just because he's light JB Harry Randall uh, it was Quirk wow um, now they were both fourteen. They were under fifteen when they recorded just a, their just a very jump. just a very quick one on Rafi Quirk. He donated a pair of uh, England boots to the Broughton Park under 15s team oh, nice. for our end of season thing. Um, and uh, at the co- I didn't know this was happening. And, I, and the coach that got the boots handed to him said, "Is anyone in the team an eight and a half?" And our scrum half, which was nice, it was a scrum half, said, "Yeah, me." And so he just gave him Rafi Quirk's boots. Awesome. Uh, However, the scrum half then said, well, I said, what are you going to do? You know, I bet you can't wait to wear them. Oh, no, I'm going to put them on my shelf. Yeah. And at that point, I went, well, I'm tempted to take those back. Because <laughs> we gave it to you because you were the same size as Rafi. Anyway. anyway. Yeah, take it back. <clears throat> put it on eBay. So it's yeah. Not that, not that it'll be worth much. But, um, next one. Who has a better 100 metre time, Josh Hodge or Henry Arundel? It's got to be Arundel, right? I reckon Arundel over 40 again, or 60, but I'll go Hodge over 100. This sounds like a trick question. Because no, they're both, get... they're both rapid. But yeah, but Arundel's rapid, rapid. But Hodge top, I reckon... Yeah, I reckon I'm going to go for Hodge. Arundel. Um, it was Hodge. So that puts Tim and two I, points to And I'll go for 11.6 again. Not far off, 11.5, 11.53. That's real wheels. And that was when they were... Bearing in mind, Dwayne Chambers, on the strength of his 100-metre time, got loads of people trying him out for rugby. Yes. He's never even played rugby. <laughs> played for Castle, Castleford Tigers. Yeah. Well, it'd probably be better be playing for Castlefield Tigers, to be fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, I think that was under 20s they did that, so not that long ago. Mm. Um, next question is, who has... <clears throat> Fifteen hundred meter PB, Ruffy Quirk or Josh Bassett? Josh Bassett has to be. He looks. He's more of a fifteen hundred yeah. prototypical fifteen hundred meter runner. Again, all of these I feel like they're trick questions because yeah. it should be Josh Bassett. So I'll go Josh Bassett. Uh, it was Ruffy Quirk. Wow, again. what a talented lad he is! High jump and fifteen hundred. High yeah. jump. What was his time? Let's go. Let me guess. I'm going to go for. I bet he did it in five minutes. I'll just go five minutes. Chris Chisunder jumped one. 1.8 metres in the jump. Really? Yeah. Wow. I'll go fi- uh, five minutes, one second. Uh, so Josh Bassett was five minutes, seven. Rafi Quirk was 4.41. What? 26. Is oh, my fast. God. Fast. Wow. Um, and that was, that was indeed... That was Josh Bassett's time, 5.07, as an under-17, but Rafi Quirk's was a, as an under-15. Oh, my God. He's my two God. years younger than him as well. What a machine. That is really impressive. Uh, next one. Who has a better long jump PB? Elliot Obatoyimbo or Josh Bassett? Give me Josh Bassett. Ob- Ob- th- Obatoyimbo. That would sound like the right answer. I'll give you Josh Bassett. JB, you've pulled one back. Yes. 2 1. Right. So let's the go, guy uh, you don't think, let's go with him. <laughs> I'll go for 6 metres 20. Uh, 6.18. Wow. Two centimetres off. You've eyed up Josh Bassett's uh, long jump. I, I used to I used to love doing that, um, track and field at school. I used to go and do extras afterwards and just do them all. So I kind of, just, I'm tuned into what the school <laughs> yeah, good, good, no no, good numbers might be. I used to enjoy it, but I can't remember any numbers. Um, shot put. My, as, uh, it used to be my event. As under 15s, yeah. um, which of the cousins won out of, name some famous... English rugby cousins. Vinopola. And Taolupe Falatao. Yeah. No. Nope. Oh. Uh, Manu Tumalangi. 
No. Uh, Sonny, Bim- Sonny Bill Williams and <laughs> Tim Cahill. <laughs> <laughs> no. It is Maru Toji and... Beno Abano. Beno Abano. So, shot put. Who is under 15? There's no way this is not Beno Abano. No, I'm going to go Maru because he's yeah. so tall. Because, exactly. again, because I used to do shot put, and just being higher gives you the parabola. It makes ah. it land land late. Right. Because gonna, it's definitely Beno Abano, I'm going to say it's going to be Maru. I'm going to go Maru, and I reckon he did 12 metres. Uh, it, was, it was Maru. Um, at under 15s, he got 14.85. And and uh, um, and in 2010, Marrow became the fourth best under 17 in the UK at shot put. Of course he did. Wow. Of course he did. 15.16. Wow. Oh, Jesus. I bet he did the spin rather than just <laughs> the bet. step. Um, and I bet he made a JB grunt when he did it. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> um, who has a better PB time out of Jackson Ray and Manu Vanapola? PB what? 100 metre PB. Jackson Ray. Jackson Ray or Manu Vunapola? Manu, Manu Vunapola. I think it's Jackson Ray. I He's, like... Oh, Jackson yeah. Ray runs really well. He does He does run really well, but Manu Vunapola, that burst that he had last week <coughs> or the other week. There's no way Jackson Ray is going on this list if he's not beating Manu Vunapola. It was Jackson Ray. Ah. To all. Um, and uh, Henry Arundel, his time... Uh, admittedly as a 15 year old uh, was uh, no sorry no he was 19 year old it was 11.74 Jackson Ray's time is 11.8 apparently wow. wow do you remember what your fastest time was Phil? Uh, 11.8 was mine no idea no idea I did, I did a 12.6 yeah nice yeah. I, I, was, I made the relay team but four hundred was. And we had no. We had. No what were your What were your events? At, uh, what were your events? Um, I didn't do that much. Um, hundred, two hundred would be. Would yeah, be four hundred and shot put. I used to do one hundred, two hundred shot put, high jump. Which I represented the school, but my school was rubbish. So <laughs> yeah, my my school was not. Yeah, we didn't really have athletics. <laughs> a friend of mine, right? In fact, a friend of all of ours. In school, his team sport was basketball, and he's pretty good. Like for a guy who's like what is he five five seven five seven? You know, as five seven players go, he's very good at basketball. Their school, and there's not many other schools in the UK playing basketball. Progressed through the, basically the Daily Mail Cup of basketball. We don't know who they were playing in the in the final. Brixton. Good luck, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Went predictably well for, for uh, five, five, five or seven white guys. One of my, <laughs> one of my, um, uh, one of my memories doing athletics. It was the the I got through the area thing, and I got through to the the county um, meet, which was in Bracknell, and I'd never done before, and I'd had no idea that this was this was the case. I'd never done heat final before. I'd only ever just run just it, done, got a yeah, time, yeah, qualified, yeah. and that was it. Mm. It's the first time I ever. So I'd never done heat final. So I had done. I didn't know what that was like. So I just in the heat, I just went out, managed, came in third, managed to qualify. Wait, sorry, what distance is this? Four hundred meters. Four hundred. And four hundred is. And it was about an, distance, an hour yeah. later, final, and. I look like an absolute twat because I'd given, I'd spent, I was absolutely spent. Are, are you, I, I didn't even know you meant to hold back. Are you meant to hold back for your heats? What? Well, because you've got to, if you absolutely gun it, 400 is tough yeah, as well. Yeah, it is tough, yeah. It's a tough and distance. And I, I just wasn't used you, to it. You've got to sprint it, basically. Yeah. But it's too long to sprint it. Yeah, so basically I tried as best I could in the final, um, and but about 250 metres... I was like, oh, no. Here and, we go. And the big crowd in the stand saw me go from, like, kind of equal fourth to last by about 25 metres. I was oh. I was trying to run, and just my legs wouldn't move. It was <laughs> so embarrassing. Yeah, there was a guy. So the other week I went to, like, one of these CrossFit things, and it was in, a, it was in where was it? It was in Longford Park. Mm. So that's a really good athletics track, actually. Yeah, yeah. Those don't know, and the event was a four hundred meter, thirty kilogram sandbag carry on the track. Okay, so it was a yeah. race, but it was a race of pairs, right? So t- typically it was like one man, 
Um, sorry, two two blokes, but it's a mixed sex team. So anyway, just don't worry about that. So there's one guy who's carrying his bag, his sandbag, and he paired up with a girl, but the girl didn't carry the bag at all. And the last hundred meters, I'm like, this guy looks wrecked, and he was indeed wrecked. Yeah. In fact, he was so wrecked that he fell over about fifty oh, meters ago. Oh God! He managed to get up, but his legs just wouldn't carry him. And he's still, and she's not, she's not even asked if, if she can, if, if, if she can carry the bag yet. Uh, fell over again, and literally about two or three metres from the line, he couldn't physically get over the line. <laughs> oh, what? Physically get over oh, the line. Oh, God. He did bloody well, though. 30 kg sandbag, does. Might have been 20, actually. But still, it's heavy. Yeah, And yeah. he was trying to sprint around the 400 metres. Yeah, yeah, meters. and he was going fast. Like So, on his own, he was keeping up with, like, the leaders, but towards the end, just died. I'm like, I don't have that. I don't have that grit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what's next from Paula? Uh, next one is uh, who can triple jump further, Ollie Hassel Collins or Josh Bassett? Josh Bassett. Well, he's already done well at the long jump. Uh, Ollie Hassel Collins went to the same school as me. I'm going to go for Ollie Hassel Collins. Josh Bassett. Does that put JB in the mm, lead? It does. Three somehow. two. And I'm just playing the game now. I'm not actually. <laughs> I would have definitely gone that with, with, with Hassel Hol- with Hassel Collins. Um, who has a better 100 meter PB? Ollie Thorley as a an under 17, or Rafi Quirk as an under 20? Wow! I think we're, we're, we're building a picture of Rafi being this absolute machine athlete. So I'll go for Rafi. Uh, Thorley, Thorley, age 16, or certainly under 17, was 11.5. Jeez! Rafi Quirk. Uh, as an under 20 was 12.1 so Ollie Thorley so Ollie uh. Thorley um, and uh, so not fast over 100 that surprises me um, as under 17s who th- this is the penultimate well actually there's one bonus question um, as under 17s who threw a discus further Ollie Woodburn or Ollie Thorley Discus. Uh, just because he's like a cat, the way he moves, Ollie Woodburn. I'm going to say his technique was so perfect. Yeah, I he, agree. he he he. It's it. nice and fluid. Woodburn is correct. Yeah. Thirty-four point one um, ahead of Thorley. Thirty-two point two. Um, who has the better five k PB? Tim Cocker or Ollie Hassel Collins? <laughs> Schoolboy wow. rivals. Yeah, both went to the same school. So. I know what Tim's is, is about 20 minutes. I think Tim Cocker. Uh, Ollie Hassel Collins has got to cane me, surely. I'll go for OHC. Well, OHC did 21 minutes dead at a Newbury Park run in 2014. Presumably <laughs> aged, aged <laughs> about 16. And Tim, your PB is? 1942. Mm. There we go. Have that, Ollie, in Have your face. And the See, fi- it's Ollie Hassel Collins is the one they put on the school website and <laughs> they're all proud about. Yeah, exactly In right. your face. The final question is, of all of the players that we've mentioned, um, who had the best 100-metre time? And that's not... so. Is this just a memory challenge? Uh, well, it's we've not actually mentioned their 100-metre time. They came up in a different one. Ah. Uh, Ollie Woodburn. Wood, Cocker says Woodburn. Thorley. It is Ibatoya. Ah. He did 11.1. Yeah. 11.1? Yeah, yeah. That's like Proper almost quick. GB standard. Mm. It's not far Proper off. quick. Yes. So there you go. Thank you, Ollie Pool. I very much enjoyed it. Oh, I very much enjoyed it. I enjoyed the data scraping as well. Yeah. I can just see Pool. Uh, Searching, thinking of Ruby players and searching for them. Yeah, I mean, I, the data scraping was incredible, and especially as it was all as a front to enable another mention of the humble brag that he is rapid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so well done for that. Uh, and with that, um, let the boys play. 
Hello, hello, it's Brooke DeVard, host of Naked Beauty, and I could not be more excited about Kate Spade New York's summer collection. They are celebrating 30 years of the brand, and the Kate Spade New York design team really outdid themselves with this summer collection. There's a gorgeous lemon-inspired raffia bag that I love, and the Bahama sandals. It's a low heel with a feather detail at the toe. Take me on vacation immediately so I have an opportunity to wear these. Go to katespade.com to shop the Kate Spade New York summer collection now. I promise you're going to find something incredible for your summer outfits.